should we schedule sex? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tell me why. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashbitz. Kaylee, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Before we we really dive into the good stuff, I have a very um, important question to ask you, and that is, how are you doing? Like, actually, how are you doing? Hmm. I am doing well. I feel tired but grounded and excited to have this conversation and very present. So that's a nice feeling. How are you doing? I uh, have never had it so good. I've never had it so good. That has sort of been my answer as of late. And yeah, it's the most honest one that I can come up with. Uh, I just, um, things are going well. I feel uh, sort of right in line with what I should be doing. Um, I'm getting married next year, so that's very exciting. Uh, so things things are are great. Um, you know, it comes with a lot of challenges being an entrepreneur. You know, working for yourself, as you know, and some things are, are don't always go our way. But um, just feeling like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing is is sort of like a is a good bit of fuel to keep you know pushing through and uh, and navigating those challenges. So thanks for asking. Yeah, congratulations. That's exciting. And it sounds like you're feeling really purposeful right now, which is such a good feeling to have. It is. It is. Um, and you mentioned feeling feeling tired and grounded. And I always think about uh like the existence of two emotions, like how they can mutually exist at the same time. It's it taken me a while to figure that out. I s- sort of figured it out after I lost someone close in my life and then spending time with my family while also like feeling like really excited to be with my family, but also feeling that loss at the same time. I then had this like realization like, oh, like I can feel like two emotions at once. Like that's, that's okay. And that's cool. Um, So um, I'm glad you, you said those two things just made me think of that. Yeah. That's a hard thing for a lot of people to come to and it, in there's a therapy approach that's actually really interesting called internal family systems that really highlights how there are all these different parts of us and uh, they have sometimes different jobs and different feelings and different desires and they can be conflicting or they can sometimes work together and um, it's it, our internal world is so complex and the more complexity you can hold the sometimes uh, more grounded and clear you can be and so i always encourage people to uh be in the uh complexity of just feeling different feelings that sometimes feel at odds with each other and that's normal part of the human experience keeps things interesting <laughs> Yeah, it keeps things like extremely interesting, right? Because for a long time, I don't know if you heard this growing up, but it was always like, um, just be happy. And, you know, that could be a fine sort of goal before you start to really experience life and everything that it has to offer. Um, and then you get struck with, you know, whatever it is. And you're like, well, I want to, I want to be able to feel this thing, this, this grief or this loss, not where it sort of debilitates me and I can't move, but enough where I know that I actually cared about the thing that I thought that I cared about. And so being able to hold those mutual emotions and feel the complexity, um, I think enriches life, uh, in, in a much deeper way than just trying to avoid the hard ones and only feel the good things. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, Brené Brown talked about how you can't selectively numb emotions. So if you're going to numb the bad stuff, then you're not, you're also not going to feel the peaks of the good stuff either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take it all. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. You got to take it all. Um, uh, Perfect segue here. Take it all uh, (laughs) to, um, to sort of what you're, you're an expert in and sort of your, what all your work is about. Um, is relationships mostly. So what does 
a healthy relationship actually actually look like? Mm, the bunny question right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right I think healthy. Yeah, right. Healthy relationships can look like a lot of different things, depending on who's in them and what they want for themselves. But I think there's some basic truths or basic uh, universal experiences that we want to shoot for. Um, and just off the top of my head, I would say clear communication, mutual respect, uh, self-awareness. It's really hard to really know someone else when you don't know yourself. Uh, mindful presence is really important in a healthy relationship. If we can't be fully in the moment with someone, then we're not really experiencing them. Uh, and I think that trust is an important ingredient. Uh, what else? Yeah. I mean, there's so much to say about what a healthy relationship looks like, but I think maybe communication and intention are two of the most important ingredients when you're building one. Uh, you ended on um, communication and intention as sort of being two foundations um, for a healthy relationship. Uh, but initially off the bat, you said one person has to know themselves before they can, you know, try and get to know someone else. Um, how does one uh, get to know oneself in your eyes? Hmm. I think we can study ourselves in the same way that we would study anything else. I think we can learn about what it means to be human from a lot of different angles, from the basic biological to the spiritual to the interpersonal to the psychological. And we can kind of just learn about what we know about being human, learn from experts, and then sit and sort of self-reflect and apply those ideas to yourself. But I think we really need to do that with other people. It's really hard. We are relational beings, so we need to be have ourselves mirrored back to each other. And so it's really hard to see the forest through the trees. So I think you can study and then you take what you study and you bounce it off of someone else. If you have access to therapy, I highly recommend everyone and their mom goes to therapy, even if you don't think you have a problem. Uh, it's not just for people with quote unquote mental health issues. It's a self-reflection tool that can really help you get to know yourself or coaching or, you know, workshops or what have you. Um, but I think before you can really engage in any of that, you have to cultivate the skill of observation and you can't observe what you're not able to pay attention to. And you can't pay attention unless you have the skill of mindfulness. So I think all of it begins and ends in a way with the skill of paying attention to what's happening in the moment on purpose without judging it. And without that skill, you're going to be kind of lost in the sauce. Are you having people develop that sort of observational analysis, that mindfulness through a meditation practice, through deep breathing, through being in nature? Um, what, what sort of tactical ideas are, are there? All kinds of approaches. Um, I think I... It depends on the person. It depends on whether they have trauma or not. Uh, if you have PTSD or a lot of trauma, sitting still with your eyes closed can be really triggering. So meditation is not an approach I would use with those folks. Uh, mindful eating, yoga, being in nature, movement, art therapy. You can practice mindfulness when you take a shower or brush your teeth, you can practice mindfulness in all kinds of different ways. And there's so many ways to approach it. Uh, it's, I do use a formal meditation as sort of a introduction for a lot of people, if that's comfortable for them. 
but I think any activity that you, you can do any activity mindfully, essentially. Um, so it's just the intention of setting some time aside in your daily life to sit with what it is you're experiencing, to feel the warmth of the coffee cup in your hand, to take a deep breath, to learn to watch your thoughts, see what the quality of them are, check in with your emotions, check in with your body, your physical sensations. That's the kind of thing that we're practicing when we practice mindfulness is bringing your mind to where your body is. And you could do that in unlimited ways. And so that practice allows us to get to know ourselves better, which then allows us to connect deeper in relationships. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. If I'm with you and I am able to not be thinking about what I have to do later at work, but I'm able to really see your facial expression and hear your tone of voice and notice, uh, my heart racing, um, or notice, uh, feeling uncomfortable in my chair. And, um, I'm able to hear what you're saying and notice my own reaction. It's just going to be such a richer experience than if my mind is in seven different places while I'm trying to pay attention to you and think about what I'm going to say next at the same time, then there's a lot of missed connection in that kind of interaction. Hmm. That makes sense. I mean, I, I've learned that idea through doing this podcast, right? I have to try and listen to the response or the note, you know, while maybe thinking of the next thing, but not letting that cloud how much I actually hear and listen to you and letting my my curiosity lead me instead of my, you know, written down notes or whatever sort of preconceived notions I have about where this conversation might go and things like that. Um, so that's why I recommend I everyone do a podcast, that. you know, <laughs> whether they post it or not, but it, it's helpful just to like, like put your phone down, have a friend come over, put your phone down in the middle of the table, press record and just riff for 30 minutes and like be present with each other for 30 minutes. And you can look back and, and listen to it if you want, just to see like your tone and how well you speak and how well you got your point across. But it's not really important. You're just thinking of like, how can I flow with this conversation a bit instead of being elsewhere, I can be sort of where my feet are. Um, I found that to be one of the most powerful tools from doing like, you know, 300 episodes, but uh, people can do it on their own too and get better at it. And then we can get better at relationships, which is sort of the cornerstone of living the good life, I think. I agree. And I love that you mentioned curiosity. I think that that's a skill that not everybody necessarily has inherent, uh, maybe a little bit, but I think people have different degrees of natural curiosity. And I think it's really vital for healthy relationships and for a life well lived. Uh, a lot of times, if someone in your life has a complaint or a criticism or a difficult topic or conversation that they want to bring up, if you can turn towards what they're bringing to you with curiosity first, before defensiveness, before you tell your side of the story, before you have, you express your feelings or your reaction, if you can ask questions 80% of the time, that approach is going to make the conversation go so much smoother. It's going to help that other person feel heard and understood and valued. Even if you don't agree with their perspective or see it the same way, just having the skill of curiosity and being able to ask questions in a relationship really deepens intimacy and helps people feel really connected to each other. So I love that you mentioned that as um, in part in your response wanted to point that out. It's important. Yes, <clears throat> extremely. I mean, and then it, it le like the, I think also the curiosity allows us not to make, you know, assumptions about the other person, which can be very easy if we've been in a long-term relationship. Like I've been with this person for, you know, 20 years now. So I know them, I know what they think. I can read their mind. And it's like, no, this person you're speaking to is dynamic and they're always experiencing new things or they might have had a 
you know, a different conversation with someone that might have changed their perspective. So, so the, the curiosity also sort of, we're not perfect, so we're never going to get this right always, but that's the point of the conversation is so we can get to the root of it. But uh, if you lead with that, then sort of your assumptions won't overtake the conversation about who you think this person is and what they're going to say and, and all of that stuff. Um, and that I think that's important too and something I've definitely had to uh, learn and adjust as I, you know, grow with my, with my partner and we try to develop our relationship over the long term. Yeah, it's really beautiful that you're aware of that. And in long-term relationships, it's especially important. I agree with that. Did um, Was there um, role models in, in your life for what a healthy relationship looked like? Or, or how did you come across or learn um, what that might look like or, or how you want to present that healthy relationship? Uh, no. Um, my coming to this work is healing my own trauma. <laughs> and I have, I have become a student of uh, something that was missing for me in my life, uh, and that I didn't feel like I had. And so I studied it. I studied a lot of uh, the literature and, you know, from like an expert standpoint. And then I studied my clients and I studied what helped them connect and what made them feel disconnected from each other. And I studied a lot of what not to do with, you know, the people around me and that I saw growing up. Um, and there are actually not too many people in my life currently that are in really healthy relationships that I look up to, to be honest. Uh, so it's kind of been a, a interesting journey of, oh, that clearly doesn't work or, oh, you know, like that's causing some pain or maybe this is a better way. Uh, so it's more of been a study of what's not helpful pointing me towards what is helpful personally. Hmm. What about you? I'm curious. Um, yeah, my, my parents, uh, are still together. Um, and from what I can see, I mean, I don't see all the conversations or intricacies of their relationship, but growing up and, and living with them and, and now knowing them as an adult, I think their relationship is, uh, is really incredible. And, you know, I, I, I sort of realized that when, uh, in 2018, I, I lost my sister, Rachel, um, obviously their daughter. And I think when parents lose a child like that, it's just like the most heartbreaking, challenging, like fucked up thing that any parent has to go through. And sort of for them to come out the other side of that with obviously arguments and, and things of that, like nor what normal people would do when going through a ho horrible thing. But now, you know, five, six years later removed, like, still together and doing stuff and traveling and, uh, you know, being a, a very integral part of my life as well and still sharing love and, and things like that. I, um, I'm very lucky, you know, that's my competitive advantage. I would say is that I, I was lucky enough to, to be born with those kind of parents. So yeah, I definitely had a role model for, for healthy relationships. That's amazing. Yeah. And very rare, I think. So that's, that's nice to have that uh, example and to be able to s just experience that that's possible. And that really um, role modeling is such a beautiful, important thing. It helps us realize that what we um, strive for is possible. And that's uh, definitely an advantage. It sounds like you have a lot of gratitude, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, much more recently um, in my life than before. I mean, for, you know, from like 18 to maybe a few years ago, being in a long-term relationship was, was not in my, was not something I wanted at all. You know, I was just a, a guy going out there trying to, you know, do whatever. Um, and then sort of things changed in my life and, and things flipped. And then when I started like opening up and, and, and trying to create a life where I had space for another person to share my life with, then I started looking at the things around me like, oh, there's examples everywhere. Um, whether that be on social, whether that be, you know, negative role models or the positive role models. Um, and so the gratitude for them, 
um, has, has deepened over time, um, especially for my mom, who I have a very, very close relationship with. And uh, so it's, it's quite special. And, uh, you know, I tell myself all the time that I'm the luckiest man in the world. So uh, that's, I guess that's why I answered the question at the top, never had it so good. So, <laughs> well, it's sort of turned into me sort of gushing over that. But yeah, that's, that's how I feel. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's good. Gratitude is a really, really important practice. And it's nice to see that it feels really authentic when you express it. Yeah, thank you. Well, another thing that I, I wanted to talk to you about is uh, is sex. Now, sex it. is something that all of us think about, you know, maybe some more than others. Some of us you know, watch it on the internet, some of us watch it in movies, but we're still all very afraid. Not all of us. Most of us are still very afraid to speak about it, what we want, what we like, what we don't like, what's good for us, what's not good for us. Um, why, why is that so still as, as sex has become more open and honest and people are more free about who they are? Why is it still very hard to communicate? Uh, Sex is a very vulnerable topic, and our society does an absolutely horrendous job of normalizing it. In fact, they, we do the opposite. We, are, we bake shame into almost every conversation that we have about sex, um, and that is hopefully changing with social media and some advocacy work and better sex education in schools. But as a culture, like in America, at least like we have puritanical roots. We literally are, our culture is literally descended from Puritans. And so, uh, you know, we as a culture make sex really taboo and shameful. And so it's really hard for people to talk about in a public way. And when it's not talked about in public and then it's not talked about in private, it really becomes a source of discomfort for most people. And so, I mean, if you, if you think about, let me see if I can explain this. Uh, this is my first attempt at explaining this kind of theory I have, but if you mm. think about children developing, uh, part of the growth process is that children's feelings and experiences are mirrored back to them by their parents. So they cry and their parents go, oh, you're sad. Or they get angry and they say, okay, you seem mad about that. Let's take some deep breaths. Like in the ideal caregiver child relationship, there's a lot of mirroring going on that helps children make sense of their feelings learn the names of their feelings, learn how to communicate their feelings. So all of the child's experiences and feelings they talk about and they can get mirrored back by the parent, except sexual experiences and feelings. So that is literally like the one and only thing that is pretty much ignored, if not shamed by parents when they see that their child's experiencing it. And it's normal and healthy for all children to discover their genitals and that touching them feels good. And, you know, like to discover sexuality at like two, three, four years old, like very, very young. Um, and usually parents um, don't say anything or they'll just like walk away or shut the door or they'll even actively shame. Hey, don't do that. Uh, we don't do that. Um, that's bad. And so we developmentally um, we, we have essentially attachment trauma in our sexualities because it's the only experience that usually is not, or is universally not mirrored back by our parents. Um, and so we don't talk about it and it seems like a very uh, secret thing. And so we just grow up in this culture from so many different angles. It's not okay to discuss or talk about. And then we get into relationships and we don't usually know our own bodies very well. If we do, it's really hard for us to tell our partners what we like or don't like. Uh, it's hard to talk about sexuality without feeling embarrassed. 
Uh, and so that's kind of like a fairly universal thing. When people come to me for, when couples come to me for sex therapy, the first few months of our work together is really just getting comfortable talking about sex. It's just sitting in, in a session being like penis, vagina, <laughs> and like feeling cringe and awkward and turning red and, you know, slowly learning how it's exposure therapy. Like the more you talk about it, the more comfortable you become. Uh, and that's just vital to having a good sex life is being able to talk about sex. So that's my spiel on that. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it falls back in line with what you uh, were originally talking about was knowing yourself first, right? So if I, if I don't know personally as Aaron, you know, what I enjoy in the bedroom, this is good for me, this is not, I'd like to experience this a little more, uh, whatever it is, then it's hard for me to express that to, to a partner because I'd never once express it to myself. Um, because like you said, there's a lot of shame involved in that. What if I like something that like my dude friends will think that I'm a weird or like, why would you be into that? That's odd. Like, so all of these things happen around sex, uh, especially, you know, from, from me, from a male perspective that I might be a little bit off. I'm trying to shove down. I'm trying to hide. I'm trying to put that away so that I can be this like, you know, prototypical guy who likes, you know, guy shit. Uh, and so <laughs> When I talk to, you know, maybe someone that I'm attracted to, I, I don't know if I should tell them that. And so I think, you know, at least from my perspective, talking to some of my friends who, who you know, have some of these things that they want to they want to be and they want to express, like that's where it gets, you know, challenging, at least in, in my view. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about these like sociocultural norms around sex, like that there's only one very, very narrow, very, very specific type of sex that's shown in porn or in media or in our in movies and it's just penetrative penis and vagina sex both people come at the same time and then we're done and then we like go go our separate ways <laughs> or we go to sleep <laughs> and that is um like the sexual script um, and there's so much wrong with that script. There's so much left out. There's so much unaccounted for. There's so much sensuality and possibility that gets um, lost when we stick to a sexual script. Uh, se you can have sex without penetration at all. You can have sex without being hard. You can enjoy sexual experiences without a penis in the room at all, which, you know, we, as a culture, we really don't even think about, um, like there is so much possibility if we led with what our bodies are telling us, the information that our bodies are actually sending us in the moment of what type of touch feels good and what we want or don't want. And if we could just hear our body's response and then communicate that to our partners, sex would really look different than we expect it to because that one version of sex that is like culturally the right way to have sex um, is so stunted and, and almost, you know, it's only, it's very um, scripted and there's so much more to experience when you come from a mindful sensuality place than when you come from like those cultural expectations and like stepping outside of what those cultural expectations are makes sense that there's some discomfort or embarrassment or worry about not belonging because we don't talk about what's actually happening in people's bedrooms and what's actually happening is really not that script as often as we think it is there's so much more to human sexuality than that uh, series of events yeah and how I mean, I know initially you said you, you get couples to just basically start talking about, you know, different parts of the body, but how then do they maybe start to become, you know, more intimate or how do they start to have this communication about, you know, I want to explore this, I want to explore that. Um, is there something that you have them do or is there a script that they might follow or or what, what might look like that for two people? 
There's a lot of different approaches to helping people explore. Um, once people feel pretty comfortable just talking about things, I might have them um, engage in reading erotica together or watching ethical porn together and talking about what turns them on. We might do some more deep diving into how they want to feel in sex. Like, do you want to feel powerful? Do you want to feel submissive? Do you want to feel lost in phys in the physical sensation? Uh, do you want to feel small? Do you want to feel, you know, there's so many, um, there's so many ways to play with emotions and sex. So we could explore uh, how people want sex to feel. And that could be different at different times and different scenarios. Um, there's a fun website called we should try it.com that I mm -hmm. love to assign to people where you go through and you rate things that you might want to try. And it gives you the results of uh, it only shows you the things that you both said yes to. So there's no risk in kind of saying like, I want to try this and your partner being like, ew, you're gross, um, which is a big fear of people for people. Um, I normalize a lot. We talk a lot about um, different things that arouse people and, and um, how common and normal and healthy a lot of those things are um a lot of the time the things people desire i would say most i would say like 99 percent of what people desire is good and healthy and it's the societal shame and the taboo-ness of it that causes people distress not the thing that they actually are aroused by um, so there's a lot of normalizing that goes on and, um, and, you know, just engaging in, in outside prompts, like media, listening to podcast episodes about it, um, you know, things that you can, that can spark conversation and inspiration, um, role-playing ideas, uh, you know, like getting into, um, trying different toys and using props and just playing like sex is play. Like we're just playing. So we're going to play with different toys. We're going to play with different emotions. We're going to play with different, um, ideas and experiences and scenarios. And, um, you know, I help people be creative and, and, um, you know, there's some stuff to work through a lot of times, like how do we initiate and how do we deal with feeling rejected? And, uh, you know, a lot of ourselves go into our sexual experiences. So it's like a rich playground and a lot of different ways of approaching, building intimacy, trying new things, having those conversations. What have you, what have you learned about shame from doing this type of work? Um, I think the main thing is that it can only exist in darkness. It can only exist in secrecy. When mm -hmm. you name your shame and you're brave enough to fully feel it in front of and with people you trust, um, it dissipates. Like it, it goes away. Um, so when you keep it a secret, when you avoid it, when you shove it down, that's when it thrives. Hmm. Yeah. So it's just it's a, it's another sort of step in 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 being open and honest with yourself and potentially with your partner about about what you're feeling. And so it it all it all starts with you know this idea of curiosity that we sort of initially led with, like being curious about yourself and you know being curious about your partner and your partner's sexuality and being interested in what makes them feel good and being interested in what makes you feel good and the combination of the two. Um, because, you know, in my experience, the more uh, emotionally invested and connected I am with the person, the, the better the sexual experience is or has been. And that's been, you know, with my partner who I'm about to get married to, like, it's where I'm more emotionally connected to her than I've been to any other a uh, person that I've ever been with in my whole life and uh and so that makes it just feel 
uh, more, what's the word? I don't know. Better's the better's not a good enough word, but like more, I don't know, more in tune, more connected, more, more free, more loving, maybe potentially those work, but, um, yeah. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I think, um, I think if we can, if you can work on whether you're partnered or not, if you can work on your relationship to self and undoing some of your shame when you are, even if you're having a one night stand with a friends with benefits, if you can say what you like and claim what you like and don't like and have good boundaries and, um, you know, communicate well, you're going to have a more connected experience across the board because you are connected to self and that is going to help you connect better with whoever you're with, or even if you're just solo and, you know, enjoying self-pleasure, just being connected um, to your present moment experience and without having to fight through a web of shame to just like what you like then that's that really goes a long way. I mean, I will share that like when I start when I became a therapist and I ju- and I just started working with couples and some it was like one of my first couples and one of the uh cu- members of the couple said like we're not having sex anymore and I like felt myself start to turn red and I realized like oh shit, like I'm not comfortable talking about sex and I'm trying to be a couples therapist that's not great. (laughs) And I had to go through this whole process myself. Like I started by listening to actually come as you are is a great book. Um, Emily Nagotsky is the author. I listened to her read it, read the audible for the audio book version of it. And just hearing her say like labia and vulva out loud in the car by myself and feeling uncomfortable I, I, I had to do that work of like exposing myself to this world and being able to talk about it for the, I started by doing it for the sake of my clients. And then it really opened up my own personal world in some really big ways. Um, but I think putting that work in to undo your shame, uh, is going to really set you free if you're willing. Yeah. It's about that, you know, authenticity piece that you've been, you know, spoke, speaking about how, how do you think about getting someone to become their more authentic self or the version of themselves that is most true to who they are? Yeah. Self-compassion. Um, I think we need to be able to look inward at things that we might judge or might make us feel uncomfortable or that society might tell us is wrong and then feel when we feel the shame or we feel the embarrassment or we feel sad or we feel rejected or whatever it is whatever hard emotions come up if we respond to our own feelings with dismissiveness or get over it or uh, suck it up or whatever negative things our inner critic wants to say when we feel scary feelings, we're never going to look because why would we like turn towards pain on purpose if it's so overwhelming and our own reaction to that pain is to be mean to ourselves. So if we can practice self-compassion and feel that scary feeling and then tend to it, oof, ow, yes, this is painful. This is uncomfortable. I see that this is uncomfortable for myself uh, and offer some love like this. I love you. I'm here with you, like reparenting ourselves, essentially. Then we will be willing to look at the scarier things. And when we look at them, then they become not so scary. Yeah. And there's so much there's so much common humanity in in self-compassion and you know the way that we judge others is essentially the way that we judge ourselves so if we're giving ourselves that that same kindness and grace then we're going to be able to do that to to others as well especially people that are close to us because we see that common humanity that 
all the things that we all struggle with are the same. Yeah, they come from different places and different experiences and different environments and different circumstances, but sort of those resulting emotions are all the same. We're all going to feel rejected and heartbreak and sadness and anger and despair. Um, and if we can, as you say, look at the pain on purpose, uh, that's a cool phrase, uh, then that's huge. That's huge for our development as our authentic selves or our power in our relationships or and all that stuff. Absolutely. <clears throat> Here's a, an interesting question that I've been thinking about. <laughs> um, should we schedule sex? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell me why. Um, the idea that sex is only good when it's spontaneous makes zero sense to me. Um, I don't go to the gym spontaneously. I don't learn new things. Like I don't study. I don't take a class spontaneously. I don't like cook dinner spontaneously. Like, yeah, sometimes once in a while I'll like feel inspired in the moment and work with what I got or pop on a YouTube video or be like, you know, I really feel like going for a walk right now. And that's great. But like anything that's really important in my life that I want to put intention into and that is like a priority for me, like I'm committed to it. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to schedule it or I'm going to have it in the back of my head that like this is something I want to make sure that I make space for. Um, and, you know, I might have a, a like good yoga class if I just spontaneously feel like doing yoga and I just roll my mat out and throw a YouTube video on. Sure, like that could be nice. I'm sure it could be a great class like here and there, but I might have a really great class if I sit with myself and I think about how am I feeling today? How's my body? I could really use a hot yoga class today, I think. Let me find a studio nearby. Yep, that timing is going to feel great. It's right after work. It's before dinner. Um, I'm going to um, make sure I wear these shorts because I'm going to be more comfortable in the hot class in this outfit. Um, oh, yep. I look cute. I love this outfit. It's going to be fun. Oh, maybe, you know, my friend wants to meet me there. You know, like I'm curating an experience for myself. And so when we think about scheduling sex, we could think like, oh, it takes all the fun out of it and makes it a chore. And, you know, like I should want to spontaneously have sex with my partner. Like, and if I don't, there's something wrong with our relationship. Or we can really shift that thinking into this is a priority in my life and something that I really care about. And I want to curate this experience and make it awesome for both of us. And so I'm going to put time and intention and resources into like lighting some candles and creating an atmosphere and and, you know, you don't want to put pressure. There's also the flip side of maybe that feeling like pressure. So it's nice to sometimes just schedule like connection time or sensual time. And if that develops into sex, that can take some of the pressure off to think about it that way. But like, I think it's beautiful to schedule something that's a priority to you. And sometimes it's really hard for people to feel sexy if the dishes aren't done and, you know, like they haven't taken a shower and, uh, you know, like they're stressed about whatever the laundry they forgot is still in the washing machine and it's going to get moldy. And so like knowing that you set this time aside and then you can prepare yourself and your day and put yourself in a headspace that feels good for sex can really go a long way for a lot of people. I think it's worth exploring. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, because like, if you listen to any person talk about, you know, managing their time, sort of everything is in, in, in deep blocks of, of what they should do when they're doing it. And so why not schedule a time? You know, it doesn't have to be like, we're going to have sex here at this moment. But like you said, it could be, this is where we're going to connect deeply or we're going to put our phones away and it's just going to be the two of us. And then we're going to play a game or have a conversation or, you know, get into deep love. And, and that usually that connection usually leads to, you know, whatever it leads to, it could lead to sex or it could just lead just a great night or a great couple hours of, of deep connection, which are both extremely important for a relationship. So I, I, I yeah, 
you may have convinced me <laughs> uh, one way or another, but uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I, I just, yeah, a lot of people are sort of averse to the idea because it seems forced and weird. Like, why would we schedule it? We're just going to like jump each other's bones every time we see each other. And I'm like, you haven't been in a relationship for 30 years. So you're not, <laughs> you don't, you don't really know like that. Uh, you're like been dating each other for, you know, six months and you're in college and yeah, great. Sure. I'm sure you jump each other's bones then that's awesome. But, um, you know, so that's, that's important. Yeah, that whole honeymoon phase in a relationship is um, really fun and really exciting and not meant to last in that at that same heightened in that same heightened way, or you wouldn't be able to function in the world if you're, you know, like in that space of being overly obsessed with each other for, you know, and, and not able to focus on other life areas. Uh, that's not really a goal we should have in our relationships. Um, that is like a, a, that small new window of new relationship energy is biologically there for a reason. And it doesn't um, serve us to hold on to that. So measuring the health of our relationship by whether we stay in that place or not is not really a great, um, not really a great approach. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you about a uh, a post you made on Instagram and the the first slide of the post says you're not entitled to be comfortable. Can you can you deep dive deep into that and wh why you posted that and what that means? Yes. Uh this is a good wrap up question as I have a session to get to. <laughs> um so I uh, I think that we have this mindset that we should be happy, healthy, comfortable, thriving. And if we're not, something is wrong. We've done something bad. We are bad. We're not making the right choices. We should fix it. Um, and uh, that's not real life. Real life being a human is not sunshine and rainbows and it was never meant to be. And when we have that expectation and every time something quote unquote bad happens, we feel that uh, we're off track. Then every time something not ideal happens, every time we're suffering, every time we're in pain, uh, we make that pain so much worse by uh, than by creating a narrative that it doesn't belong, that it's wrong. Uh, being suffering is part of being human. So if we could accept that we will suffer and things will go quote unquote wrong and we will have pain and things, we will have loss and we will have grief, then when those things arrive in our lives, we can meet them with a lot more grace and acceptance. That doesn't mean we like it. It doesn't mean we want it to happen. It doesn't mean we're like, yay, you know, my friend died. But we, when we accept, okay, yes, this is part of life. We can radically accept that this is happening. And then we can move into, okay, how do I tend to myself through this pain rather than, oh no, this is wrong. This is bad. I need to fix it. It's just a very different uh, mindset that can create more suffering on top of our pain when we can't accept that we're not supposed to be comfortable. We're not supposed to be happy and thriving all the time. We are designed you know, I mean, I don't mean that in like a creationist sense, but I mean, biologically, we are designed to experience a range of emotions, which means that even the hard, dark emotions are uh, supposed to be part of our experience. So I wanted, pe I, I wanted people to stop painting those experiences as wrong um, and start seeing them as, okay, this is part of the human experience. I can accept that and attend to it. Perfect. That's a fantastic way to, to wrap up this, this episode. So thank you for your, your time, your attention, your thoughts. 
um, and your expertise. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me as a guest and your thoughtful questions. And I'm sure we could talk for many more hours. I appreciate your time and um, I hope you have a nice restful day and I can't wait to hear the episode and hear what people have to say. Comments and questions are always a fun part of this experience. So that'll be fun. <laughs> Looking forward to it. If you enjoyed that episode, please click here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But above all else, above all else, most importantly, please, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.